Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, wherever or rather whenever you are. Good afternoon or good evening to you and welcome to this very first webinar of a series of three jointly organized by Swiss Re Institute, IBM Research and the Gottlieb Duttweiler Institute. Today coming live and in color to you from Swiss Re's Center for Global Dialogue. You've seen it right away in the intro. You just been showed at Ruschlikon, Switzerland, the reason why you have to watch all this on your desktop computer, your laptop, uh, or any other, I presume, fairly rectangular device. Instead of enjoying the quite impressive 360 degrees view of Swiss Re's lovely conference forum, well, the reason for that doesn't need any explanation. It is too small to see. It has a little crown and it is royally messing up with health and economy on a global scale, I'm afraid. But hey, here we are, nevertheless, in your face, coronavirus. Today, it's all about anonymization and privacy protection in the age of mass data collection. So it is all about our age and I dare say, presumably, it will be also about ages to come. Big data, that's the one side of the coin, the availability of large-scale behavioral data, which dramatically increases our capacity to understand and potentially even to affect the behavior of individuals and collectives. All there, systems running, up and running, and the other side of the coin, trust, trust or rather the legitimate privacy concerns raised by the use of this ever-increasing amount of data collected. And it is about the tool which is supposed to address these concerns of privacy to create, maybe restore, this ever-important trust. Anonymization, the promise whoever is using big data wants to make. It is a promise. You want to say, we use your data, we use your data, but it will be utterly and totally impossible to identify you behind it, behind this data. It may start with a company's uh, employee survey. You certainly had one or two of them yourselves, or had your employees to answer such surveys. Maybe you're being asked to leave your email address after being done, after having finished the survey. Do you really click the send button after all the points you made and all that? I mean, what happened to your online shopping history? What happens to your travel bookings? What happens to uh, your online shopping, your customer card, your health data, your smartphone, and so on? Much, much more. How safe is all this? Can we truly trust? Two experts are joining us today to discuss all this. We have Eve Alexandre, maybe the gallery might. Yes, thank you very much. Here he is, Dr. Eve Alexandre de Montjoie from Imperial College London, where he heads the, uh, as assistant professor and lecturer the computational privacy group, so researching how human behavior impacts the privacy of individuals in large scale metadata data sets. He is a technical expert appointed by the Belgian Parliament to the Belgian Data Protection Agency, and he was a special advisor to EC Commissioner Vestager. I'm sure you all know the lady in Brussels. He was a postdoctoral researcher at Harvard and received his PhD from MIT under the supervision of Alex Sandy Pentland, a professor who one might call with all and respect, the god of data. Eva Alexandra's research group focuses uh, on identification learning, showing the limits of anonymization in people's privacy, basically bringing to light, bringing to light what is not working to provide true privacy. So basically showing people the mistakes they made and make which is leading to their other research fields of this computational privacy group, safe data sharing, it's called, and the societal impact of artificial intelligence. So I dare say Dr. de Montjoie is indeed covering today's topic from cover to cover. And we are being joined, we are being joined 
by Dr. Jeffrey Boone, born from Swiss Re Institute, where he is the head of research and engagement. Before that, he was the chief science officer and head of GX Labs at State Street Global in San Francisco, a company for which he earlier on, I think, established the Portfolio Analytics and Valuation Department in Tokyo. So he is indeed, you are indeed fluent in Japanese. I am. You are indeed. Something I like to think that might be confusing one or another yes. data gathering algorithm that you're fluent in English and Japanese. Not too common, is it? Earlier positions of Jeff's were uh, with PwC Japan, Standard Chartered Bank Singapore, Shinsei Bank in Tokyo. Uh, Jeff is an affiliated researcher at UC Berkeley Center for Risk Management Research, and occasionally he also teaches at Berkeley, the University of Singapore, and Tokyo University. After having said all this, uh, I dare say Swiss Re will be very happy to have him, and so are we today. Welcome to the both of you. And thank you to Florian and Yves Alexander to uh, be a part of our initial uh, deployment of the studio. So this is quite exciting <laughs> for us at the Swiss Re Institute, and we're glad that you could be here uh, at this inaugural event. Many thanks thank for you. your kind words. I'm sure uh, uh, Yves Alexander is agreeing with that. It is indeed a very Absolutely. nice studio, I have to say, very nice studio. Maybe, hopefully, somebody at SRF is uh, watching too. Whatever, <laughs> here we go. Welcome to the both of you. As we will have a, an extended Q&A uh, after the two speeches, a Q&A where you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, will have the main part, the leading role. Do not forget to hand in your questions as they occur. We are all very keen to hear, well, read, uh, your questions. This webinar is, after all, all for you. So just watch your screen. You will be guided through the process when it comes how to hand in, how to send your questions to us, which we will have a look at after the two speeches. So keep firing away your questions. We will uh, give our very best to answer all of them. And there are questions being put to you also, three questions to be exact, which are concerned with the rather unpleasant problem I just mentioned a little earlier uh, at hand currently, the bloody virus. You will be seeing a so-called QR code. Take a picture of it right away. There you go, you see it, a QR code. Take a picture of it and this code then will take you to the questions to our little pool consisting of exactly three questions. First one of them will be, will you be downloading a so-called contact tracing app issued by your respective governments? For example, uh, the German government just released their official corona tracing, contact tracing app, I think like 30 minutes ago. So will you be downloading such an app of your government? Probably yes, probably no. Second question, do you trust the government, your government to handle your data in a private data safe way? Rather yes, rather no. Again, we are highly interested in your answer. And finally, do you understand how anonymous contact tracing actually works? Do you understand it not at all or on a rather rudimentary uh, level or rather well, or maybe even on an expert level? So there you go. We're looking uh, forward to having your answers a little bit later in the Q&A and we're looking forward to having a decent sample of answers. And no worries, your privacy will be guaranteed here by Swiss Re. No worries there. So let's get started. Enough of me. Let's get started with Yves-Alexandre de Montjoie from Imperial College. Yves-Alexandre, the floor, well, to be honest, the camera, the screen is all yours. <laughs> Shoot. Thank you very much. Um, so I don't know if you can see uh, my slides. Good. Okay. Um, so basically today I'll uh, try to give a short introductory speech on anonymization and privacy protection uh, in the age of uh, mass data collection. Um, so really the kind of data that we are talking about today is, is this kind of data. Large scale data automatically collected as a side effect of our use of technology. Um, very uh, sensitive data 
but also very useful data. Data on how people have been moving around, data on how you've been searching things on Google and clicking on links, data about what you've been buying. And, and this data is, is, is you know, quite unprecedented and, and really forms the basis of both a new field of research and the emerging field of computational social science in how we can use this data to better understand humans and societies at scale, but also very much form the basis for a lot of the progress that we have seen in the past 10 years in artificial intelligence. However, interestingly, when you, when you look at this data, uh, very quickly, there, there is a privacy concern. There is a concern that this data is quite fine-grained, revealing, and potentially sensitive. And interestingly, uh, when you start raising those questions, uh, very often you get the same answer. This is one example from my home country of Belgium, uh, in which basically mobile phone data was being tracked uh, by the city of Antwerp. Uh, and then if you were starting to ask questions about the privacy uh, aspect of this data collection, uh, you were being told basically that you should not really worry, that only the signal is being tracked and that the data is anonymous. I'm sure you've heard this before. Um, um, interestingly, from a, from a technical perspective, actually, uh, you know, to further reinforce the point, you're being told basically that, that there exists, uh, you know, basically 40 years of, of literature in how to anonymize data, how to de-identify data, taking a data set, pseudonymizing it, removing names, removing phone numbers, removing email addresses, and then de-identifying them adding noise, generalizing the data set, suppressing uh, some of the rules. And this is even more important because it is very much baked into the law. Very quickly, from a legal perspective, in both GDPR and CCPA, as soon as the data is, not, is anonymous, it is not personal data anymore. It is not your data anymore, and you don't have any right over this data. And basically what Jeff asked me to do is to give a short intro to basically how do you reverse engineer anonymous data? The third thing is pseudonymization. Uh, you know, basically I told you the first step is we're going to remove names, we're going to remove phone numbers, we're going to remove email addresses. But is this sufficient? And, and the first question we ask here is basically, you know, let's say you have no names you don't have any direct identifier, what does it take to find someone in, for example, a large-scale location data set? What does it take if I were to know Jeff and I'm searching for him in a data set, I know it's in this data set, and I'm searching out of millions of traces which one is Jeff? And to do this, I would use point, places and times where I know Jeff was. For example, I know where Jeff was uh, yesterday evening when we had the preparatory call. I know where Jeff is uh, today uh, in this building between 10 and 11 a.m., uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the big question is basically, what does it take? How many points, like how easy is it for me to find Jeff in a data set that does not obviously contain his name? And basically what we showed is that this is, this is quite easy. Uh, take a large-scale mobile phone data set of 1.5 billion people over four, 15 months. We showed that basically four points, places and times where someone was, is enough to uniquely identify him or her 95% of the time. So large-scale data set, lots of people moving around all the time, yet knowing four places and times where someone was is enough to uniquely identify him or her 95% of the time. 95% of the time, you're going to be the only person that was successively at those four places at those four times. So certainly pseudonymous data are not anonymous. But, you know, in the 40 years of literature, we have more than this. Uh, for example, adding noise, right? The, the idea is basically the same than what you can see in this picture at the top. It's basically if you add enough noise, at some point, you can hide someone's identity. You cannot recognize this person anymore in the picture. But the question was, can we do the same with location data? Can I start making the data less precise? Can I start you know, generalizing it? Can I start adding noise and prevent re-identification? 
prevent the game I just played and prevent me from finding Jeff. Actually, here again, we tried and basically showed that it doesn't work. I'm not going to go into the details, but in short, the risk of re-identification follows a power function, which basically means you get decreasing return as you are adding more and more noise. So very quickly, adding more noise does not necessarily uh, is not necessarily sufficient to preserve the uh, anonymity of the data set and to prevent re-identifying people. Very quickly, a few more points are going to be sufficient, again, to uniquely identify someone and for me to find Jeff. The third technique that was, that was used, again, to try to preserve anonymity, try to preserve privacy, was uncertainty. The, the main idea being either from incompleteness, the data set is not complete, it does not contain every single person in Switzerland, or maybe I sample this data set, maybe this data set contains only 5, 1, or 0.1% of uh, the population, and that might be sufficient to create enough uncertainty and therefore call this data set anonymous. And you see quotes saying that basically sampling, for example, creates uncertainty that the person is in the data set, and that is sufficient uh, to create um, this, this plausible deniability that you actually identified the right person. And on the one hand, it's true, right? Is yes, if the data set does not contain the entire population, we can never be sure that you found the right person. Yet, there's also this, this discipline uh, called statistics that's actually quite good at uh, quantifying uncertainty. And this is exactly what we did. We took data sets and we tried basically the extent to which we could build a model that would tell us the likelihood of us having correctly identified a person even in heavily incomplete data sets. As you can see on the right, this basically works very well. The model is very well calibrated. And basically what we were able to show in this research published last year is that basically with 15 demographic attributes, we could re-identify a US person in virtually any data set, in including heavily incomplete data set, 99.98% of the time. And if you want to try, we've actually proposed, uh, we have a website basically where you can go try the model with your own data. We do not collect your data. And then you can see what would make you stand out, what would make you unique uh, in the entire UK or US population. So all of this basically led us to conclude that at the moment, anonymization in the traditional de-identification sense, taking a data set, try to modify it one way or the other and release it publicly does not work anymore. It might have worked in the past. It might have worked 20 to 40 years ago. It does not work with the modern data sets that are currently being collected and the broad set of uses that we want to make of this data. And we very much agree with PCAS, who basically says that they do not see it as a useful basis for policy. Yet, despite this, we keep seeing examples of data sets that you know, people tried to anonymize, released online, only for them to be re-identified later. There's two examples from Australia, quite recent one. Uh, one of them basically a uh, medical claim, 30 years of medical claim that were released publicly, as well as a government survey of 96,000 employees. The latter was downloaded 58 times before they removed it from the open web. Another example, very well-known example, but you might not know that it is actually a re-identification, is this. Basically, for a very long time, a lot of people have been searching for Trump's tax record. And at some point, it made the cover of the Times that actually he was not doing that well uh, from a wealth perspective. And interestingly, when you look at the details of the uh, article, you can see that actually they learned this from a publicly available data set that was released at the time with a one-turn sampling 
and identifying details removed. So basically, this information and the fact that Trump lost more than a billion comes from publicly available data that were anonymized back in the days and used today to re-identify him. So what do we do? A popular answer has been, well, we should criminalize it, right? We should say that, you know, this should be legal. If you anonymize data set, you should not be allowed to re-identify it. We don't think that this is a good solution. This is very short-sighted, very limited, and does not address the fundamental issue that the technology that we're trying to use does not work. Instead, what we're suggesting is, is really the need for a paradigm shift. We need to move away from this old 20-year-old notion of taking a data set, modifying it, and then release it in the open, hoping that you anonymize it properly to the modern field of privacy engineering and a range of solutions that have been proposed in how to properly collect and anonymize data. That includes a lot of techniques that we will be discussing with Jeff, including differential privacy, secure multi-party computation, homomorphic encryption, or synthetic data. One cautionary tale is that there's a lot of excellent technology that have been developed, but none of them are a silver bullet. And as an example, here is uh, one technology that was developed basically to provide uh, instant privacy compliance, basically anonymizing data on the fly through an SQL proxy. The idea developed by uh, this German company called Aircloak is basically to provide you with an SQL access to a data set and to make sure basically that everything that is sent back to the analyst is always aggregated. You never see an individual person's data. What you get back is the result of queries you've been sending, which is how many, how many uh, men in their 30s do I have in the data set, or many of them are making more than 40k a year, et cetera, et cetera. On top of this, to prevent re-identification on top of only sending back aggregates, they add uh, basically layers of consistent noise. I won't go into the details, but basically it's a very smart technique of adding basically uh, seated, static, and dynamic noise. So basically what, what this means in, uh, in practice is that if you come and you try to you know, learn something about a person, learn something about Jeff in this uh, data set, you're gonna come, uh, like you know, in this case, we're searching for Bob, who's a 40-year-old man in the Department of Computing, and then you try to learn whether he's making more than 100K a year. And if you go and you ask this question, basically I'm searching for a man who's 40 in the Department of Computing, uh, and uh, has a high salary, making more than 100 k a year, basically this is what you're going to get back. This information, the U0 is basically a 0 or 1. Is there one person or not? And then every single one of the other terms are basically a little bit of noise. Each of them sufficient to hide the information of whether Bob makes more or less than 100 k a year. Very good system, adding quite a bit of noise, and making sure basically that no individual level information is leaving the system. Yet, um, they developed this, they tried every single attack that exists in the literature. Yet there is one that they did not thought about. And basically this is an attack that had been uh, thought of uh, 13 years ago, actually, um, to be an attack on basically the fact that in, in short, the fact that they are adding a little bit of noise uh, to each of the query, and that this noise depends on the information they're trying to protect is a risk. Because the noise in itself contains a little bit of information about what they're trying to protect, about the data set they're trying to protect. And this is exactly what we uh, exploited to try to attack uh, this uh, system. Again, I won't go into the details, but basically what we really go for is the noise. We try to look at how the noise would be distributed in one case versus the other, in the case of the person making more than 100k a year versus less than 100k a year. And by basically studying this noise, we try to make a prediction 
on whether the person makes more or less than 100 kilo beer. Just to give you a sense of how well the attack works, this is basically this is basically the likelihood of you to find a person, to re-identify a person, so that's the fraction of all record, as a function of the known attributes. So many pieces of information do you have about this person? All right, and then you can see that very quickly, for example, with 10 attributes, you are close to 90% of the people that you can uniquely identify. This is for one data set, if I literally just give you the data set, pseudonymized. These are four data sets that we tried. And for each time, this is how well we could re-identify people if we had access, direct access to the data set. Literally, you give me the data set. And this is the equivalent attack when the data set is protected by the system. In short, as soon as you know of our attack, very quickly, you can recover the sensitive information. You can uniquely identify someone, often clo as close as it gets to me having access to the original data set. Basically, the two of them are indistinguishable when it comes to a credit card data set. You see a small gap in the census. The CDR, you see a small difference. But basically, as soon as you find this attack, you can recover a lot of information about people. And again, this is much more of a cautionary tale. Um, you know, I think this, the system is, is very good. It's just increasingly, as we're relying on, on advanced techniques and system, uh, we need to be aware of the fact that, that new attacks will be proposed and those new attacks will completely uh, uh, change the protection offered to uh, data from one day to the next. And this is, I think, for us, something that, that we're really trying to push. And really, by developing uh, new attacks, we really hope to inform future research direction and contribute to improving privacy in practice. We really try to help redefine what constitutes anonymous data, ensuring that we can use the data at large scale for good while giving individuals strong guarantees on their privacy. Thank you. So many thanks indeed, Eva Alexandre, for your insights you granted to us right away. And uh, I'm, I'm deeply impressed, to be honest. I'm deeply impressed that uh, if it's about uh, privacy in the digital, digital realm, make a lot of noise. Interesting, interesting. Well then, ladies and gentlemen, please do not forget the possibility, the option, the imperative of uh, taking part in our webinar via questions. You can hand in via your computer. Uh, you are invited to send our questions. I think so far we got two questions. This, is, uh, this has to be better. We need more questions from you. Uh, I'm sure during the talk of, of Eva Alexandre, they have some more questions raised. Go ahead, shoot firing them to us. We are looking forward to almost answer them all. All right, um, so I suggest we do go right ahead with Jeff Bone, giving you more food for thought, more food for questions to fire at us. Jeff Bone, the head of research and engagement at the Swiss Re Institute. The floor, the studio is yours. Thank you. And thanks, Eva, Eva Alexander, for setting the, the stage. Uh, it's, it's a bit worrying if you think about how much we interact are online now in our regular lives. And just a quick anecdote from my own life, uh, I, I've received in the past year or so some very targeted spam where the spammer has uh, an uncomfortable amount of information about me. And I think that this is the point uh, to take away from this first talk. Much of the anonymization techniques that many of us thought were secure really aren't. And as we become more interconnected, there's certainly value to that. Without the interconnection, we couldn't have managed through this coronavirus. It would be difficult to have things uh, delivered uh, to your home based on online ordering. It'd be hard to work from home. So there's certainly benefits, but we need to be aware of the costs. And this is a big research theme for the Swiss Re Institute. And we, we talk about it uh, along three major dimensions. Uh, and I'm just going to take a few minutes to discuss some of this research because I want to save most of the time for more discussion. So it, the, the overarching approach is what we call confidential computing, 
So this is how is it do we put in effect certain types of protocols, uh, engineer processes that can provide a higher level of data security. But within confidential computing, there are a couple of sub-themes. One of those is differential privacy, which we've touched on. And this is very important, particularly in light of the fact that data regulations around the world are quite fragmented. So how you manage differential privacy is very dependent on the jurisdiction within which you are operating. And this is particularly important for companies uh, that, that have to think about uh, their global data strategy. The other area or sub-theme is uh, privacy-preserving analytics. And I find this to be very exciting because this is finally a, a collection of ideas that could give us the capability to provide much more secure uh, data encryption all the way through what we call the data value chain uh, management and still enable the analytics that, that people are becoming more dependent on. And I think that's the first point to emphasize. There's this trade-off. There's a trade-off between security and speed and uh, the, the range of things you can do with the data. And I think that that's a trade-off that's a very nuanced, complex argument. Often it gets simplified. And this is where a number of us in this community really need to get a better handle on what we're proposing when we talk about particular approaches. So that's quite important. Now, this is happening in a world that's moving faster technologically than the regulation, the culture, and the norms. And that's something that we need to be aware of. So we have these technologies, the, these technology developments that are now converging. These are the Internet of Things, IoT, uh, new distributed ledger technologies, with, which give us more robust ways to manage data, not necessarily securely. That's a different question but it does give us ways to manage data on an interconnected basis. And then we have 5G, which is gonna be fantastic in terms of speed. However, that just makes it that much easier to move big data sets around and do the type of de-anonymization de that, that was discussed before. And then overlaying all of this is all kinds of machine intelligence. And one of the challenges uh, for those of us that work in the artificial intelligence, the machine learning, arena is that we really want to see data at its most granular level. However, that's where we're often creating the data privacy problems. So if you think about trying to implement some of these new tools, at some point today, people have to decrypt that data if they want to apply the most innovative machine learning or artificial intelligence tools. Now, there's certainly approaches that are being taken to approximate this calculation, to eliminate the need to get quite to that level of granularity. But I will argue that the, the big payoff to collecting large groups of data, uh, setting aside for a moment the data security question, that will give us many more insights that's going to leverage new kinds of businesses, realize the potential for for data, in fact, uh, in, at least in, in my community, I do a lot of research in this machine intelligence space, we talk about data being the new oil for the digital economy. And in order to make that useful, we have to refine it. Now, we typically call that data curation, but to do that well, I really want to understand at a, at a granular level what that data looks like. Now, uh, there are two different approaches, uh, actually, uh, at, at the, at, at the at the beginning, we will work with two approaches. In the end, it will probably be a mixture of approaches. But, but one approach will be hardware-based. And this is where uh, companies like Intel are creating certain types of capabilities that allow you to focus where you manage the data in a very specific way. So you, you, you limit the security vulnerability to a very small uh, area. It's called an enclave. But this enclave becomes the area that you worry about for data security, and then the rest of the data process is uh, secure because the data is fully encrypted. The other approach is software-based. However, that has limitations both in terms of transaction speed. Today, most of the software approaches that at least we're aware of are not fast enough to be practical from a business uh, perspective, but we think that will change. Uh, secondly, uh, currently, the, the, uh, the range of analytics you can do on this encrypted data is still quite limited. Now, again, that's also changing quickly. We have partners that are doing research in this area, and we think that will change. 
The question of whether it's going to be a hardware solution, a software solution, or potentially a hybrid solution is still a matter of debate in the research community. In any case, it's, it's an exciting time to be a researcher and a product developer in this space. Uh, I think that we need to be having more conversations though with the broader community and with the regulatory community uh, so that they understand the strengths and weaknesses uh, of these, these approaches. Because I think the thing that we've learned over the last 20 years is the technology got out ahead of what was really uh, possible. And many of these hacks and de-anonymization de approaches uh, should give us pause about any of these newer technologies. So with that, I will hand it back to Florian to, to tell us the questions and, and uh, moderate a discussion with the three of us. Indeed, I will. Many thanks, Jeff. I'm sure of it. It has been just like after Eve Alexandre's speech, a uh, hell of a... Uh, round of, uh, well, virtual applause round in front of computer screens around the globe, or at least Switzerland. So please do allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to remind you, you still can hand in your questions, but the number has increased indeed, uh, which is uh, excellent. Many thanks for your questions so far. Keep on firing them at us. And I will be, as Jeff kindly said, so, and to our two experts. So let's get started with the Q&A, uh, where you and your questions come into play. Um, I think that there, there's one question, uh, which is basically just, you know, connected to what you said last. Companies that are deploying these kind of techniques are an absolute exception today. Is that right? I think I'll ask you first, Jeff. Yes. Uh, sadly, I think that is true. Uh, the, there, there was a, uh, a flurry of development in anonymization techniques that Yves Alexander was referring to many years ago. And unfortunately, there's not been a lot of progress in, in that specific area. And as a consequence, the companies today that are thinking more rigorously about managing uh, encrypted data, I think, uh, are very few. Yves Alexander, coming to you, uh, I, I'm just wondering, I mean, in a way, it seems, it seems almost outrageous that, that companies are only at the very moment, or only recently became of the, aware of the problem itself. Is that so? Is, isn't that astonishing? I mean, they started, lots of companies started to collect data, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and now, oh, right, uh, the stuff is not encrypted. Problem. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I, and I, I mean, I, I agree with Jeff. It is, it is, it is, it is disappointing and, and worrisome. Um, and, and I think to me, it's it's really something that that we need to reflect uh, upon. I think the main um, really question to me is 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 how do we get those technologies in the hands of the many, and how do we make those technologies uh, easier to use? Uh, I think there's definitely some work to be done uh, by the research community in trying to make those tools more uh, available and easier to use uh, safely. Uh, and then I think there's also quite a bit of work to be done uh, by companies uh, in a sense of really trying to, to move uh, privacy and especially privacy engineering uh, from being a, a compliance question, a question of, okay, like what is, like, you know, what do I need to do to be like you know at the minimum okay with the law, uh, and and really into how are privacy technologies an enabler? How are privacy technologies a way that will allow me to do to do a lot more and to use this data a lot more while maintaining high privacy standards? And I think there's there's a real question of how do we how do we move the conversation from a from a mere compliance uh, question to an enabler. Jeff, following you to what Eve Alexander just said right now, uh, there's a very good question. It's a simple one, but I like it. I like it very much. How difficult is it to deploy? We just heard it's early days, frighteningly early days. How difficult is it to deploy these methods on a large scale? And I think companies, usually yes. we are talking large scales, aren't we? Yes, well, I think it's still very difficult. I mean, that that is the the topic of uh, research for specifically the Swiss Re Institute. And, and actually, it, it highlights an important point that I think is sometimes lost in the, the discourse about these topics. I would include machine learning and artificial intelligence. 
and that is that things that work on pilots or small proofs of concept where we have very narrowly defined scales don't often scale well. And there's a big difference between enterprise scale privacy preserving analytics that work in a way that are pragmatic, meaning that you can actually do transactions at a speed that don't shut your business down. Uh, and that is something that's still a challenge. In fact, I think it's a challenge in all these technology spaces that are now converging. IoT, distributed ledger, the encryption capabilities, uh, the types of machine, in le machine intelligence. We've seen this work on very small scales, but whenever you try to scale it up at an enterprise level, I have not seen it work yet. Now, I'm sure that there's somebody on this call that is having this work, and they're far, farther ahead than a lot of others. But I think it's, it's a very important point. Indeed it is. Uh, I'm coming to another uh, uh, next question, which is concerned with something uh, you, Eva Alexandra, have been uh, illustrating by one of your slides, uh, talking about regulation, regulating uh, uh, the whole thing about, about uh, uh, well, you know, making criminal uh, the actual fact to, to if, if companies are not complying to anonymization of, of data. Um, there's a question, has anybody already pressed charges against companies using anonymized data that has been traced back? You said it's not a good idea to, to leave it to the lawmakers, but I think that's a highly interesting question anyway. Yeah, no, no. So basically, um, so I think I was, not, I was not clear. So there's really two uh, parts. I think one part is really... Uh, for companies is how do you make data uh, anonymous? And, and if you claim that your data has been uh, anonymized, how do you show that the data has been anonymized? Uh, the one I was referring to uh, for criminal charges is actually for people trying to re-identify this data. It's basically for, for you know, hackers, uh, researchers, but also companies uh, trying to re-identify data that was purposefully uh, anonymized. And I think why, on the one hand, I think that it, it really makes sense to have this notion of anonymous data. And I think it's a very good uh, guarantee, easy to understand that we can give to people and a good way to, to ensure that we, we fully use data, including for a lot of the AI and machine learning, while giving strong privacy uh, guarantees. What I think is not necessarily a good idea is to, to basically try to to fix something that is essentially a failure of the technology, a failure of the identification by making it criminal for researchers, uh, uh, data scientists and companies to, to, to develop re-identification tools. I think that's basically, you know, kind of a, a, a way to try to put a patch on something that does not really work and then try to really fix something that is a technical issue with, with a legal patch, and I don't think that's a good idea. I think it's mostly going to lower the technical standards and prevent research showing uh, how technologies are, are working or not working. So I really do not think that this is, this is the way forward. Jeff, um, talking about regulators, not only lawmakers, like regulators in, 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 in a broader way. Uh, usually our, our experience in the digital realm is that uh, uh, progress in the digital realm is mind-bogglingly fast, uh, 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 light speed, so to say, and regulators <laughs> constantly and regularly are lacking, lagging behind. So when it comes to anonymization of data and, and the possibility to de-anonymize it and all that, what do you think about, just quickly, about regulating all this? Well, I think it's the real question, which I don't have time, I'm sorry, the real answer, which I don't have time to go into, is, is going to well, be specific. Well, we have like, um, 17 minutes, okay, well, but please don't use a, up all of them. It's, it's uh, very specific to jurisdictions. So you have GDPR in Europe which I think was a first good attempt. I think there's a GDPR. lot, it's the, the general data protection regulation that was uh, put together in Europe. The problem with this regulation is that it, it was quite blunt in terms of its approach, and it didn't necessarily address all the, the issues that we will face, but it's a, it's a start to provoke the discussion, and that's not necessarily the case in every jurisdiction. I think that generally speaking, though, we do not have the type of regulatory architecture, for lack of a better term, to deal with some of these new 
uh, issues that we're that we are approaching. I mean, I, uh, actually, I, I I do have one suggestion, and this is also a question for Eves Alexander. Uh, in uh, in the U.S. and a few other countries, certain types of professions are subjected to higher standards of conduct. So, for example, medical doctors and lawyers, and uh, and even companies that that produce certain types of goods. You know, for example, if you if you manufacture a car seat for children in a car, you're subject to certain regulations. And the reason why that's important is that if there's a problem, so let's say you're a doctor and you're doing something in the operation that's negligent, you are now subject to tort law and you can be sued under a different set of criteria than would be the case for just an average person. Because the idea is that you're held to a higher standard of conduct because of your training. The same would be true for, say, a car seat. You know, if there, if there was some, a defect in the manufacturing process, even if it wasn't necessarily intentional, the company would be found negligent uh, under, you know, under this body of law in, in some countries. My question is whether that would be a better solution than criminalizing the behavior, but at least create uh, potentially a, an architecture where people could go back to a firm, and you know, I'm not going to name any names, but we all know some of the oh, big hacks. Do. We know please the big do. hacks in in in, uh, <laughs> Indeed. in 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 the world recently, and the fact that the data were not properly uh, secure. Jeff, one I could have, argue. Please forgive me to interrupt you, but I have a question which fits right perfectly well uh, uh, to what you just said. Who? in brackets, institutions, persons, could become a trusted hub or a source of ensuring people's privacy? Do we rely on enterprises to take over self-control, so they are self-regulating, so to say, or on a data scientist to act in a responsible manner? How can we ensure transparency? Yeah, that's, that's, that is a very good question. I, I, I think right now I just have a fragmented set of ideas. I mean, one would be to create certifications and then hold people to a, a higher standard of conduct. Or so that you hold them accountable. I think, what, I wonder what, what Eve Alexander is thinking about that. What about transparency? Have you had, do we have a trusted hub? What do you think of, of Jeff's uh, suggestion? Uh, I'm, I'm in general in favor of, of transparency uh, solutions, I think. Um, w when it comes to anonymization, specifically in GDPR, um, I do think that actually I, I do give credit uh, to the regulator. And actually, when it comes to anonymization, actually, I'm honestly technically quite impressed with the way they decided to deal with uh, the definition of what constitutes anonymous data, uh, which is actually it is anonymous data unless someone can, under reasonable circumstances, prove you wrong and ensure that actually you can re-identify this, uh, this data. Uh, which, which I think is, is from a regulatory standpoint, a, a very smart move. It's really like, you know, we are not going to set the standard. We know that the standards are going to have to, to evolve quite fast as technology develops. And so we're going to set, you know, it's, it's, it's anonymous unless someone proves you wrong. And if someone proves you wrong, then it's on you to update your systems. Uh, and I do think that from a regulatory standpoint, this is, this is a very smart way of, of defining it. Um, what I do think, however, we're, we're missing at the moment is, is um, a bit more work by a regulator and data protection agencies to try to help uh, uh, companies see the different set of technologies and, and go one level deeper with, with guidance on you know, what, is, what is currently at the moment considered a reasonable standard for anonymization. I think we have you know, we have the law and we say, okay, like it's anonymous unless you can re-identify. I think one thing that, that could really help is how can we as data protection agencies uh, basically help uh, companies uh, have a better sense of what is, you know, what is reasonably, what can be reasonably considered anonymous uh, by, by today's standards. And, and from that perspective, I very much agree with, with Chev that I think more transparency in how are we currently anonymizing data would be extremely beneficial, uh, both in terms of individuals getting, uh, being reassured that actually their data is handled properly and actually uh, anonymized, but also for companies to, to get a sense of what is everyone in the field doing 
what is what is reasonable uh, today and very much trying to learn and take inspiration from what is happening in security in which there are fairly clear standards of what is secure and what is not secure. And after a hack, uh, after a leak, um, actually this, it is often for security professionals quite easy to come back and see, okay, like, were they, you know, was it bad luck or, or was it basically poorly done uh, uh, security? Uh, we need ways to, to build the same know-how when it comes to privacy and data anonymization. Indeed, transparency is increasing trust. I think that's something worthwhile to note and remember. Talking about transparency, we owe you the results of the poll of the three questions we asked you at the beginning of this webinar, and here we go. There we go. In the light of the corona pandemic, that's been the first question. Would you download a contact tracing app issued by the government to help fight the spread? Probably yes, 70%, probably no 30%. I asked the gallery to uh, let's see the answer to the second, and I think then we discuss it uh, summarily. Um, can we have the, the, there we go. Do you trust the government was the second question to so handle your data in an anonymous manner? Rather, yes. It's almost the same uh, uh, percentage as we saw with the first question. 68% rather trust uh, governments and 32% uh, rather don't trust the governments. And we had this third and last question we put to you. Uh, do you understand how anonymous contact tracing works? That's uh, fine, almost fine. 50-50 <laughs> uh, affair, not at all, or rather rudimentary, or rather well, or on an expert level. It's basically 50-50. Jeff, I'm asking you just quickly, yes or no, you're surprised by these answers? Yeah, or, or? I'm uh, a little surprised uh, about the, the trust in the government, but maybe that's not a bad Ooh, thing. Switzerland, uh, that's, that's, that's Jeff, true. blimey. Uh, the, and the uh, uh, the uh, not, not too surprised about the, the others, but but I do want to talk about this trust point mm -hmm. because I, I have two more ideas that I think could, that, that could be interesting for uh, producing this trust. So one is something that we've learned uh, from the way that the the U.S. government manages its uh, aviation. So there's something called the the National Transportation Safety Board, and this is an example of government that works because the NTSB over the last uh, several decades has been very rigorous about analyzing every air accident wherever it occurs and then drawing conclusions from that to help inform the way they think about aviation. And a lot of people don't realize this, but aviation is a success story for interaction between governments and companies in, in uh, creating incredibly safe transportation. Where is data yeah. privacy coming in there? Well, so, so the, the, the data privacy comes into the fact that every time you have a major hack where data has come out, why don't we create the equivalent of the NTSB for data hacks so that we can collect data post-mortem and companies are just aware that they have to cooperate with these experts and understand where the vulnerabilities were, why did the encryption fail, or whatever the, the, whatever the failure point was. Learn from your mistakes. Learn from, from mistakes. And having, having something like a centralized, uh, a global agency? Well, I don't know. If it, I, I, it's probably not going to be global, but uh, you know, I think major economies uh, you know, could develop some multilateral approaches to this, or maybe even industries themselves could create an entity that does the work. Quickly, oh. Eve Alexandra, th sorry, Jeff, what do you think about this idea? Have, have it, having a it. data in TSB. I love it. I think it's a, I think it's a brilliant, um, I think it's a brilliant idea. I absolutely agree. I do think that we have, I mean, again, I agree, you know, GDPR, GDPR is not perfect, but it gives us a, a good basis uh, to, to work from. Uh, and, and I agree with Jeff that I think really what, what we need to do and, and to really you know, you were talking about data as the new oil. We really need to create trust in this new data economy. We need data to flow. And, and for data to flow, we need to create this, this trust. And, and, I, and I agree that we will only create this trust if we have a, a regulatory agency with enough uh, technical capabilities to, to yes, come after act, uh, try, to, try to pen test, try to define standards, and, and be there to, to guarantee this trust that, 
you know, like we now take for granted when it comes to aviation, uh, we should be, and I really hope that in the coming 10 years, we will take it for granted uh, when it comes to when it comes to privacy. Um, you know, the best proof that regulation works is that you, when you don't hear about it. But, but you know, you both are obviously very fond of the idea, so am I, but how realistic <laughs> is this? Well, I mean, we know the bureaucracy, we knew how long it took for the EU to establish a new... Uh, you know, uh, digital laws concerning the digital area and all that, how realistic this is going to happen? Is it rather the industry which should be, you know, leading the way or should we wait for regulators? Well, I, I, we, we probably should not wait for regulators. I would like to see the industry figure out how to resolve this problem collectively. But I, I, I do think that there may come an inflection point. Uh, in fact, I was quite surprised with some of the, the large hacks of pretty sensitive information being leaked uh, that's now available on the dark web. And there's even something called hacking as a service now. You can, you can easily <laughs> go out and, and outsource uh, hacking if, if you like. Uh, I would have thought there would be more outrage. And, and there was a modicum of outrage, but you know, the, the, the way that the data now uh, can be lost out to you know, all kinds of different actors should, should motivate people to try to address uh, this problem. But, but you're, you're right, it's gonna, it'll be very complicated and take more time than we anticipate, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't start. There are lots of still, well, we still have quite a bunch of questions. I'd like to go in, in a quick way. Let's do a quick round before we come to a conclusion here. Um, I ask Eva Alexandra, for example, uh, are there any recommendations for small and mid-sized enterprises that cannot afford to sustain higher standards of conduct? Uh, I'm not sure what the question is, sorry. Well, there you go. Um, you know, basically, we, we, we were talking large-scale uh, uh, solutions to this problem. You think, um, the question is, are there any recommendations for SMEs that cannot afford to sustain higher standards of, of conduct? You know, is, there, is there a small solution for small companies? Or I is think it, it's, it's very much take so, so. Go ahead, shoot. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I, it, it's very much you don't need to be, you, you, I mean, you don't need to be a large company. It's very much a question of the, there's a range. And that's why, you know, when I moved to Imperial, I actually renamed the course from privacy enhancing technologies to privacy engineering. Uh, because to me, it's increasingly an engineering uh, uh, discipline and, and problem. And so there, there's a range of really good technologies out there. And then it's a question of how do you combine them together for one specific use case and identify the specific use case that you can solve uh, very well. So I think even for small companies, there is a range of, of good solutions out there. And it's very much a question of identifying what is the right tool for the right problem. Thank you for that. I think we have to come to an end. Uh, it's close to 12 noon. But still, I want to ask you one question uh, to both of you. And please, please, I beg you, please be brief. Uh, let us, let's have a glimpse into the future, let's say in 10 years' time. Both of you, if we start with Jeff, how, how will individuals protect their data or companies? Will companies have succeeded in, in convincing the public that the data privacy is real, sustainable and established? In 10 years time, will we be there? Well, in 10 years time, I think that there will be a lot more capability available. Uh, it probably will not be used by everyone, but it will be used by a large chunk of the population. And uh, the third trend uh, is that, that individuals learn how to manage their own data. So I think that there will be a realization that individuals have to take more responsibility. And then uh, I expect that we will have the development of something like a data custodian, uh, similar to what evolved for the asset management world where we have uh, custody banks. A watchdog. Yeah, so, so somebody that can be clear that the data is accurate, it's secure, and, and well-managed. So uh, a universal benchmarking capability. Eva Alexandra, we, we can't see it, but I'm sure to your left or right hand side, there's a crystal bowl. Have a look into it for us 10 years' time. Where are we? 
Um, I don't know where we will be. I can say, like, you know, where I hope we will be. Uh, I think from my perspective, it's we would be in a place in which we will have a strong, comprehensive uh, regulation when it comes to uh, privacy. We will have uh, good practices and, and the type of policing uh, that uh, Jeff mentioned uh, that will create uh, a lot of trust uh, for people to participate uh, in this in this new economy. And we will have, we will finally see the, the benefits of interoperability and free flow of data under the control of the individual because we have those those strong uh, regulation that provide a safety net and that make sure that you know whatever you do and whatever button you click on, uh, things are going to be okay. Thank you, Eva Alexandras, ladies and gentlemen. It's almost, it is almost, it is exactly high noon, not speaking in terms of data privacy, of course, but in terms of schedule. So let's come to an end. Uh, I do think we realized, just uh, Eva Alexandra mentioned it uh, like 10 seconds ago, trust is key. You didn't hear it here first, but you heard it here once more truly emphasized and rightfully so. So let me thank our truly insightful experts who graced this webinar with their expertise and in-depth knowledge. Many thanks to Dr. Yves Alexandre de Montjoie from the Imperial College in London. Thank you so much. And thanks to Dr. Jeff Bourne from Swiss Re Institute. Many thanks in the name of the audience to both of you. Uh, uh, giving you both a big virtual hand right now, I'm sure of it. And of course, many thanks to you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today for this first of three webinars, number two to follow in a week's time. But before we come to our final goodbyes for today, there will be a little survey, once again, another survey sent to you by mail very soon by the, our hosts, and they will be very grateful if you have a quick look into it. The recordings of today's webinar uh, will be put online on the event website later today, on the latest in the evening. Director's cut, you know what that means, not edited in the least, uh, including all my stammering, all my grammar mistakes and all my frightful mimics at no extra charge. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, Webinar number two, Tuesday, 23rd of June, 11 a.m. Central European Summertime, so to say, same time, same theatre, uh, meaning your desktop, your laptop, your mobile phone, whatever. Don't miss it. We would be missing you. When it be, will be all about numbers. The title of webinar number two, Quantification, Keeping Score in a Metric Society. Swiss Re Institute, IBM Research, and the Gottlieb Duttweiler Institute. We are counting on you. See you then. Stay healthy, stay curious. Thank you, and goodbye. See you next week.